Last week we, uh, we reviewed the introductory material concerning the book of Revelation. I just want to you know, very briefly go over that with you, get everybody on the same page. Some of the things we said, high points, key points. First of all, the book itself, the book of Revelation written by John the Apostle. Uh, he used apocalyptic style or literary style of writing uh, in order to disguise the meaning of a lot of the things that he was talking about, to hide it from the Roman uh, officials who were persecuting the church at the time. Uh, it's also addressed to the seven churches in Asia Minor. We'll talk about them in a moment. Um, in the book, he describes the struggle in the first century between Rome and the church. That's really what this book is about. Uh, he encourages the church to persevere in suffering uh, because ultimately his promise or the promise that God makes is that Rome, their oppressors, their persecutors will eventually be defeated. He also describes the ongoing cycle of struggle between good and evil that will end with Christ's appearance at the end of the world. And so we, we have two points of view here, two things that the book is accomplishing at the same time. And the material is presented in a series of visions uh, that reveal Christ and His relationship and dealings with the church on earth and as well as the church in heaven and also the destruction, the eventual destruction of Satan. So when it says revelation, the revelation is of Christ and what Christ is doing and what Christ will do. Now the theme of the book is the revelation of Christ, as I mentioned, and the outline of the book follows that, follows that theme. And if you don't get mired down in all of the imagery, you know, the, the visions and the imagery and so on and so forth, the book is rather straightforward. So today in our class we're going to examine the first two sections of the outline that I gave you uh, last week. Uh, the prologue is the beginning and that is where Christ communicates, He communicates, chapter one verses one to eight. And the first verse, and uh, you know, I forgot to mention, open your Bibles, Revelation chapter one. I'll be throwing the verses up on the screen, but some of you like to kind of read out of your own Bible. So Revelation chapter one. The first verse in the first chapter gives insight into the time that the, that the rest of the material is referring to. And so if you read you know, uh, Revelation chapter one, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place and he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bond servant John. There's no mystery there, where's the mystery? He's not using any type of mysterious language. He's explaining how, or John is explaining how he came to get this, these visions and this information and what this information was about. It's about things that are going to happen when? Soon. And so in the very first verse, John, you know, not warns, but advises or educates his audience, his readers, that the things he's going to talk about, although mysterious and a lot of visions and frightening, are things that are going to happen soon. Now I said last week that there are four main views on what Revelation is referring to, and I'd like to go back to those, kind of go over those once again with you. The first view, um, is the preterist view. Uh, preterist, uh, someone you know, uh, wanted to know, well, what is pre, you know, where does that come from? And preterist is a term that refers to something that has happened in the past. It's actually um, a term used to describe the tense of a verb, the preterist tense. So if I go, the verb go is in the present. I go, you know, I go now. And if I say I went, that's the preterist tense, past tense. So that's why they use the term preterist for the point of view that suggests or that teaches that the book of Revelation refers to the events that took place during the writing of the book, the struggle between Rome and the church. So the preterist view is that everything in the book of Revelation has already happened in the past. Okay? 
That's why they call it preterist, that view. Then the idealist view or teaching, sometimes they also call it the philosophical view or the spiritual view. This view says that the book contains principles that refer to the church's ongoing struggle with the evil in this world and how eventually, ultimately, the church will uh, be victorious. And so the idealist view means that the book of Revelation describes a cycle of events that continue throughout history, up and down. You know, they're, they're, the, you know, the church is the church is persecuted, things are going bad, you know, and then all of a sudden, oh, there's a revival, and the church comes back and starts getting strong again, and then it goes down again, it goes up again and down again. And if you read the history of the church, uh, we study on Sunday mornings, uh, isn't that kind of the history? Up and down and up and down. It grows, it gets smaller, it's persecuted, it, it's victorious, it goes on and on. So the idealist view says that the book of Revelation is a, is a road map, if you wish, of, how, of the cycle of up and down that's going to take place between the world and the church until Jesus returns and the final victory is won. Then the historicist view. Um, the historicist view um, uh, says that the book of Revelation is a forecast of the entire period of church history between the first and the second coming of Jesus. So they're saying, historicists, they say, the book of Revelation describes symbolically the history, the actual history that will take place between the time that Jesus comes the first time, you know, to die on the cross and so on and so forth, and the last time that He comes. And a lot of their teaching is to try to match up events in the book of Revelation with events in human history. That's why they call it the historicist view. And then the fourth view is the futurist view. And in the futurist view, the book, uh, people say, or teachers teach, that the book of Revelation describes mainly the events that will take place at the end of the world. Total prophecy. Now there are a lot of good arguments to support each of these views and when it comes to the book of Revelation, I mentioned last time, it's wise not to be too dogmatic because there are a lot of things that we don't completely, uh, completely grasp. However, if I were to say what I personally believe is the very best approach and the one traditionally followed by most teachers in the Churches of Christ and the Restoration Movement, I would say that we hold a position that is a combination of the first and second views, as I explained uh, last time. I believe that the book of Revelation is about the first century church and its struggle with its Roman oppressors, and its symbolism and message also contains basic principles that point to an ongoing struggle between the church and the world all the way through history until Jesus returns. Okay? So I believe this for several reasons. First of all, the context suggests it. You know, the very first verse in the book says that what the book will describe are things that will shortly take place. So it's about things that is going to happen soon in their lives. Well, only two centuries between the writing of the book and the fall of Rome. That's, for Bible, that's soon. Two centuries, that's not very long. Again, in verse three, John says that, that the time is near for these things to happen. Secondly, a book that contained a look into the future or only principles about good and evil um, would not be very comforting to the people at the time who were suffering real persecution. I mean, think for a minute. If the book of Revelation was only about the end time, you know, the, when Jesus returns for the, the, the second time. If the book of Revelation is only about that time, well, the people who are suffering you know, right away, there's not a lot of comfort for them. Yeah, sure, he's going to come one day. Well, what about what I'm going through now? Number three, the historical and futurist views do not deal with the reality of the Roman Empire. 
In addition to this, a lot of their historical applications don't fit the symbolism of the book. For example, in the historical and futurist views, they try to make the second beast the Catholic Church. Remember I said you know, they, try to, they try to sync up all the events or all the symbols in Revelation to actual historical events and actual historical people and institutions. And so they, many of them claim, well, the second beast, that's the Catholic Church. But the Catholic Church didn't exist in the first century. As much as they like to think that they did, but we know that they didn't. Historically, we know it. See what I'm saying? So these two views begin with an assumption. This, the assumption is, oh, the book of Revelation is only about the, the end of time. Or it's, uh, it's really about you know, uh, actual history. And then they tried to prove their point of view by you know, gerrymandering all the symbols, you know, putting the square holes in the round pegs and so on and so forth, and it doesn't fit. There's always pieces left over. And so I think that the combination of the preterist view and the idealist view together explain accurately, but in a very simple way, most of the symbols and images and purposes of the book. And when I say most, I, I, I'm not saying all of them, but most of them. And when you are uh, dealing with the Bible and you're trying to interpret a passage and so on and so forth, and there are various interpretations, and that happens, the rule of thumb is, the rule of good interpretation is, you go with the interpretation that explains most of the things. In other words, you go with the interpretation that answers most of the questions. And usually with the one that is the most straightforward. If you have to kind of invent stuff to make it happen, you're not, you know, you're not really doing justice to the, to the text. And so the combination of the preterist and idealist view explains most of the symbols in context. Uh, for example, it was written to encourage and warn the early church about events that were soon to take place. And we know historically those things took place. And two, it does provide every generation an encouragement that Christ will care for His church and be victorious in the end. So even though I read it today in the 21st century, even though I know that the historical stuff has already happened to the early church you know, in its persecution with Rome, I still can draw comfort from the idea that it promises at the very end, even our suffering, even whatever we're going through in our lifetime, Christ will be victorious. And so it answers most of the questions, it solves most of the riddles. And so for these reasons, we're going to study the book as a letter written by John, dealing with contemporary problems in the first century church offering God's solution that would continue to encourage the church all the way to the end of time when Christ returns. So let's go back to the text. Let's read chapter one, verses one, two, and three. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place, and he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads, and those who hear the words of the prophecy, and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. Notice, he says it twice. Now how many times does he have to repeat something? And so John establishes the fact that what is to follow is a revelation given to him by God, and it concerns events that will take place in the not too distant future. Okay, let's keep reading. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from Him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before His throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to Him who loves us and released us from our sins by His blood, and He has made us to be a kingdom, priests to His God and Father, 
to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, so it is to be, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says uh, the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And so in verses four to eight, John specifies to whom this message is addressed. It's addressed to the churches that formed a kind of a network of churches in Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. Seven congregations of the church. And he also mentions from whom. So he says this letter is going to these people, the seven churches, and he also mentions from whom the letter comes. But he says it again in a, in a different way. The, the letter comes first of all from the Father because he says the letter comes from the one who was, who is, and who is to come. And so that's the Father. Past, present, future, that's the Father. Then he talks about the seven spirits, that's the Holy Spirit. How many spirits? Not six spirits, seven spirits, the perfect spirit, the Holy Spirit. And then of course, Jesus Christ. He refers to Him as the Son, the Savior, and the Lord. So there's no doubt that this is the God that they worship as He is fully revealed here in His triune nature. All those people say, oh, the Trinity, that's not a Bible doctrine, you know, that's no such thing. Uh, take a look at uh, Revelation and you'll see that John refers to the Godhead in three different, very specific persons. In verses seven and eight, he mentions Jesus coming in judgment. Okay? Now this doesn't refer to the second coming, but rather the coming of Jesus to fulfill the things that are written in the book. I'm writing you things that are going to happen and Jesus is coming to fulfill those things, the things that are written in the book. And there's usually a lot of confusion and debate here. The coming of the Lord is a phrase that is associated with temporal judgment, not just the second coming. You know, in Matthew 24, 27, uh, Matthew refers to the coming of the Son of Man, but it's in reference to the destruction of Jerusalem, 70 AD, because in Matthew 24, he's talking about when the, when the Son of Man will come to render judgment. Well, that's not the end of the world, that's, that's on Jerusalem, because Jerusalem was judged in 70 AD. You see, when, when God is said to be coming in the Bible, it either means He's coming to judge a nation for some reason or other, like He came to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. He came to judge the Amalekites. He came to judge Egypt, firstborn, right? Or the same phrase, the coming of the Lord, can mean the final second coming of Jesus Christ. Well, how do we know the difference, someone says? The context? The context. In Revelation 1-7, the coming of Jesus refers to the things that John has said will shortly take place. So he said, God gave to Christ who gave to the angel who gave to me information about things that are going to happen soon. And the Lord is going to come to make these things happen. Well, is that the end of the world or is that the soon part. Well, it's the soon. He's coming soon. So history shows, oh, one thing I want to mention, a little parenthetical statement here. The people in the first century who read this, they may have thought that the coming of the Lord was the, the actual second coming or the end of the world because they had no way of knowing that. So, so they may have thought it was the end of the world because it was the coming of the and when John says things that are going to happen soon, they may have thought the things that are going to happen soon are, oh, it's the end of the world. And we know that some Christians thought that because Paul writes to the Thessalonians and that was one of their problems. They thought Jesus was coming right away, so they stopped working and figured, well, let's just wait for Him to come. But we, of course, with the advantage of history, we know that 
you know, the Lord is coming, His coming. That wasn't the second coming. That was the Lord coming in judgment. On who? Well, on Rome for what they had done. So history shows that within a relatively short time, this persecution stopped and Rome crumbled and the Christian religion survived and it flourished. The Christian religion was freed from the shackles of Judaism when Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. And then it was freed from the persecution of Rome when Rome was destroyed. And then it really flourished, it took off after that. So historians will credit the breakdown of you know, government and the emerging strength of surrounding nations as the reason for Rome's fall. But through the eyes of faith, we see God working to destroy this enemy using other nations as His servants. And I mean, we, we've seen that in the past, haven't we? You know, God used Nebuchadnezzar. He even called Nebuchadnezzar His servant. He used Nebuchadnezzar to punish the Israelites. He used the Philistines to punish the Israelites. So it's nothing new. God uses various nations to carry out His will. So the premise of the book is established in the very first eight verses. God reveals His plan to John. John addresses the church with God's plan. Christ is preparing to come to save them from their present suffering. And His coming and salvation will be soon. And one other thing, His coming will also render judgment on the ones who are oppressing Him, or oppressing them, excuse me. So in the next section, the message concerning Christ's coming changes as John has his first vision. In the first vision, Christ begins by warning the churches about their spiritual condition, listen now, before He comes to visit judgment on their enemies. So the letters to the seven churches, they're warnings to seven churches that, hey, you guys better straighten up because a judgment is coming, not necessarily on them, but the Lord is going to you know, judge their enemy. The Lord is going to do something great. So they need to pay attention. So the very first vision, that's a, a vision of Christ and His church here on earth. Chapter one, verse nine, all the way to chapter three, 22. We're not going to read all of that. I told you this was kind of a survey. So in these next couple of chapters, John begins describing his first vision, one in which Christ appears to him and gives him a message for the churches. Now there are more than seven churches that existed in those times. There weren't just seven churches. But these congregations formed a kind of a network of churches around the church where John did his work. John did his work in Ephesus. After Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, I mean, there was a strong Christian church in Jerusalem, obviously that was where the church started. But when Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, the center of church work and church teaching and so on and so forth moved from Jerusalem to Ephesus. And so Ephesus became the point where missionaries were sent out, became a very strong center for Christian teaching and so on and so forth. And there was a strong church there established by uh, Paul. And so in his later years, John was a member of the church at Ephesus, okay? And so uh, more than seven churches, but these seven churches were targeted. Also remember, the, se the number seven was significant in referring to what is perfect. And so seven churches symbolizing the entire church. I'm writing to these seven, but these seven symbolize the entire church. So we go to chapter one, beginning in verse nine. And in this passage, John has a vision of Jesus and Jesus in His glorious state. So let's read that. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So he's talking about his exile in Patmos, why he was sent there. He was a preacher, so on and so forth. Christianity was being persecuted. The Romans sent him there. Uh, and uh, let's continue. It says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He even tells you the day that he had this vision. And I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see 
and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. So he's given the command to write a book while he was in exile on Patmos and the book is to be addressed to the seven churches and their names are even given. So we keep reading verses 12. He says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the middle of the lampstands I saw one like a son of, uh, like a son of man. And so the lampstands are later explained as churches, the lampstands are churches, um, among which the Lord is present. So the image that he sees is the Lord present among the churches. All right, verse 13. Clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in its strength. And so what do we have here? Look at this image, all symbolism. First of all, the Son of Man. Son of Man is an Old Testament title for the Messiah. So the Jews understood Son of Man, when somebody says, the Son of Man is coming, they meant the Messiah. That's why they were so insulted when Jesus referred to Himself as the Son of Man, because He was saying, I'm the Messiah. All right? a, a long robe, a long robe suggests royalty. Ordinary people didn't wear long robes. Royal attire. The golden girdle, the sash, if you wish, a uh, uh, symbol of the priesthood and purity. Uh, a hair, the hair white as wool, Nobody has hair as white as wool, um, uh, is the, uh, the concept of uh, the supernatural. This is, we're not looking at a, just an ordinary man here. So th this is supernatural. Um, the eyes aflame uh, uh, refer to knowledge. Uh, you know, eyes aflame that see everything, that burn away all uh, lies and, and, and untruth. Um, uh, feet like, brown, uh, like bronze refers to power. A voice like many waters, a universal, universal voice. All men hear this voice. Seven stars in his hand, authority. Um, the sword from his mouth, of course, the word of God and the word of judgment. Two-edged sword, right? And the face shining like the sun, well, the vision itself is awe-inspiring. So the vision of God with each element describing different facets of God's character and being. So that's His vision. That's, that's the Son of Man. That's the Son of God. That's Jesus and He's standing among the churches. Okay? So that's why we call this part Jesus and His churches. All right, 17 and 18, let's read. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last, and the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Well, who else could that be? <laughs> There's no mystery there, right? John is afraid, and Jesus reassures John that it is he, the Lord. Think now, John, a righteous man, called as an apostle, done miracles, has written, has written inspired text, the one that Jesus loved. Okay, anybody here can uh, lay claim to any one of those qualifications? No. And yet, when he sees Jesus, this righteous man, when he sees Jesus, what happens to him? He falls on his face in fear. Can you imagine facing Jesus without the cover of His blood? I mean, it's like, it would be like being incinerated in a heartbeat, spiritually, and of course, physically. Uh, that is what happens, isn't it? And so John is afraid and Jesus reassures him, don't be afraid, it's me, he says. Verse 19, 
Therefore write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So he's told to record his vision and explain the meaning of the seven stars. He's told that the seven stars are angels who belong or serve the churches represented by the lampstand. In essence, Jesus is saying that He is close at hand. He is close to the churches. He is ready to judge and intervene in the things that are taking place, but first, He has a specific message for the churches. Now, the next two chapters, which I encourage you to read, you know, read ahead. Like I said, we won't read all of the passages, we don't have time. So I'm encouraging you to be a couple of chapters ahead of me so when I talk about things, you'll know what I'm talking about. So anyways, uh, he lists seven churches and a message for each one. And each church has specific problems and needs which are addressed, but the entire message contains some basic principles which are repeated from church to church. In other words, he says the same thing from church to church in different ways, and so there's a commonality about the things that he says uh, to these churches. So what I want to give you are the seven principles of the seven letters, all right? Here we go. Seven principles of the seven letters. Principle number one, Christ knows every Christian. He knows every disciple. Every single disciple in this room, He knows you. He knows you intimately. The Lord knows in intimate detail the work or the absence of work of each member of every congregation. I mean, this should, either, this should be a source of comfort or maybe a source of motivation. Comfort if you're, if you're a servant of the Lord and maybe not getting a lot of feedback, maybe not getting a lot of attaboys, maybe no, nobody's noticing your service, your hard work, and you're not trying to be noticed, but you know, everybody likes the, their work to be, well, he's assuring you he knows and he sees. And if you're faking it, you know, well then he knows that, he knows that too. This should be, as I say, an encouragement or a motivation. Second principle, Christ wants pure doctrine. Christ wants the church to guard His teachings. This is more a warning to the leaders of the church, the shepherds, because you know, that's their main task, to guard the doctrine. The church needs to be careful in what it hears and what it believes and what it teaches. The doctrines that you hold and teach will make a difference. People say, oh, doctrine's not important. And I say, how can you say doctrine's not important? The knowledge of the doctrine of salvation is what makes you saved. If you don't know how to be saved, you're not. Nobody, was ever, nobody gets to heaven by accident. <laughs> you know? It's a deliberate thing. You find out about it, you want to go there, you obey the gospel, and so on and so forth. So imagine if you're not teaching the proper gospel. Imagine if you're teaching things that are not biblical. So one of the principles in the seven letters is that Christ wants pure doctrine. He wants us to be careful. Number three. Christ wants dedicated disciples. The Lord mentions service five times out of the seven letters. In Thyatira, uh, He says the last works are greater than the first works. In Philadelphia, He says there's a great opportunity for service. In Ephesus, He said you left, you've left your first love, repent. In Laodicea, he calls them lukewarm and he tells them he's going to reject them. In Sardis, he said they're not living up to their reputation. All of these things refer to the service that the church was rendering one to another or to those uh, around them. So Christ cares about what we do and how we serve. Fourth principle, he wants Christians to live in purity. There's to be no compromise. When he talks about the problem with Jezebel and the Nicolaitans, some of that is sexual impurity. Our standards are not to be set by the world around us. We have higher standards than the world around us. And as I say, one of the principles in the seven letters is that Christ Himself cares about our sexual purity. And so we need to be careful about that. 
Number five, Christ wants the church to persevere. Now the Roman persecution had been going on for several years and it would continue for some time. The Roman persecution embodied the spirit of all those who would oppose Christ until the end of time. So we, we don't, we, well, I was going to say, we don't have a government that kind of blocks us to practice our faith, but you know what? More and more we do. I don't think they block us from practicing our faith, but we're being more and more repressed in expressing our faith outside the church house. More and more our government is saying, you know what, you can believe what you want, so on and so forth, but keep it to yourselves. We don't want it in the public square. We don't want it in our schools. We don't want it in the government. We don't want it anywhere else except in the building. Well, you know, <laughs> that's not our commission. Our commission is not to keep it in the building. Our commission is to get it out of the building. So in a way there is some repression and Jesus Christ wants us to persevere and not be discouraged. Number six, Christ wants all to be saved. All of them to be saved. You know, he said, because it's possible to be lost. He says to Ephesus that he'll remove their candlesticks. He says to Laodicea that he'll spew them out of his mouth. I don't know about you, but that kind of says to me that you're, you're out, you're gone. If he takes your candlestick or he spits you out of his mouth, isn't that kind of saying to you, you're lost? You cannot serve God and mammon. If you serve the world, you lose your salvation. If you refer, refuse to serve Christ, you lose your salvation and Jesus is saying, it's not that I want you to be lost, I want everybody to be saved, but it's possible to lose your salvation, so be careful. And then finally, the, the seven principles, Christ wants to reward all. He wants to reward Christians who overcome. The final word to each of the seven churches is that if they overcome, well, overcome what? Well, the temptation to deny Christ or overcome the temptation to return to the world or overcome uh, 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 the persecution and suffering on account of their faith. If, if, if they overcome these temptations, they will be not just rewarded, they will be richly rewarded. And some of the things that are mentioned in the letters, the rewards that are mentioned, you'll eat of the tree of life, you will not be hurt by the second death, you will have a new name on a white stone, receive the morning star, white garments, name in the book of life, a pillar in the new Jerusalem. You will sit and you will reign with Christ in heaven. All of these things are symbolic ways of saying that those who remain faithful will resurrect from the dead. And here on a Wednesday night, you know, it's, it's, uh, how many times have I said that to you? And we're going, yeah, yeah, that's right, we're going to resurrect from the dead. But you know what, the other day I did a funeral for a man who was only 50 odd years old, in perfect health. He just died of a, just a tragic accident, a fluke accident, and he drowned. And he's laying there in the coffin with his children and his grandchildren around, you know, dumbfounded. One minute they had grandpa and the next minute grandpa was dead, he wasn't even sick. And when I talked about the resurrection to those people, I guarantee you the idea of the resurrection sure resonated with them. Those kids, they sure wanted grandpa to resurrect and they sure wanted to be themselves resurrected so they could be with grandpa. So that's a marvelous, fantastic gift that God will give us, that we'll have eternal life with God in heaven and reign with Him in power over all the spirit world. I mean, I don't even know what's in the spirit world. Spirits, I guess. But if you're the right hand of God, that means that you're at the, the position of power. What a promise given to us. Who are we, made a little lower than the angels? So, this is the encouragement to the churches in the area of Asia Minor, but who represented the entire church and by extension the same message for the churches today whenever it meets. So the message to the seven churches um, continues to call forth to all the churches throughout history to us today and it will be relevant even into the future. Okay, next time we get together we're going to talk about the second vision. I encourage you to read ahead.
because as I say, I don't read all the passages. Four, five, and six. So if you're a regular Bible reader this week, your task is to kind of cover three or four more chapters of the book of Revelation. All right, thank you very much for your attention.